Hello, everyone, and welcome to today, today's Trenchless Technology webinar. I'm Mike Kesdi, Associate Editor at Trenchless Technology, and I'll be the moderator for today's presentation, Clarity Point, when to grout, when to line, when to do, when to do both, and why. We're going to take a quick poll, so please submit your answer and then click the blue Return to Presentation button. In recent decades, municipalities, county governments, and sewer districts have made considerable investments to restore and revitalize the underground infrastructure. With more than 800,000 miles of mainline sewer pipe and 500,000 miles of service laterals, we're just getting started, and with every year that passes, the problem intensifies. Two trenchless technologies are proven solutions, but they offer very different answers. Curing place pipelining, commonly known as CIPP, is a structural solution, and injection grouting is non-structural. Both have their strengths and advantages depending on the assessment, goals, and objectives of the project. For the next hour, we hope to bring clarity to when to grout, when to line, when to do both, and why. To weigh in on the topic today, Avanti International, our webinar sponsor, has assembled five subject matter experts representing all facets of the industry. The panel was selected based on their experience, knowledge, and understanding of how injection grouting and cured-in-place pipe work as standalone solutions and complementary answers to restore and rehabilitate the sewer collection system. Presenting today, we have Jonathan Cunet from CDM Smith, Juan Bedoya from the Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department, Randy Bellinger from Visusor, Lynn Osborne from NASCO, and Don Rigby from Avanti International. We'd like to start today's conversation off by taking a poll. Remember to select the Return to Presentation button when you complete the poll. I want to remind our attendees at this time that this is an interactive event, and following today's presentation, there will be a live question and answer session. We encourage you to participate by typing your questions in the designated panel in the left-hand portion of your screen. You can also maximize your viewing window by clicking the box with the X at the upper right of the slides. All right, let's take a look at these results before we get started. Based on your current beliefs, which trenchless technology would you engage to control I&I? &I? Looks like 57% of you selected combination of both technologies, 38% selected CIPP, 3% selected neither or alternative technologies, and 8.5% selected injection grouting. With that in mind, I'd like to turn the conversation over to Jonathan Kune. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as, uh, as Mike mentioned, my name is Jonathan Kune. I, I'm the conveyance market leader for CDM Smith in the Northeast, and I've de dedicated the majority of my career to assessment and rehabilitation of underground infrastructure. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to start out um, today by first discussing the various applications for ejection grouting in our industry. There are four common uses for injection grouting, including uh, mainline sewer pipe joints, otherwise known as testing and sealing. Uh, injection grouting can also be used to seal the annual space that exists between the mainline pipe and CIPP liner following reinstatement of service laterals. The grout can also be used to, to line up inside of a service lateral pipe also to seal the joints as well. And lastly, uh, injection grouting is, is very commonly used during the preparation work prior to manhole lining uh, to seal out active infiltration or signs of previous infiltration as a way of preparing the manhole for the installation of a cementitious or an epoxy coating. So now that in, in determining what to recommend between injection grouting and CIPP lining, the, the first step that one should take is to determine the goals of the rehabilitation program. Uh, you may have a situation where you need to remove a large percentage of II by volume due to some regulatory requirements. Uh, furthermore, a primary or secondary goal could, could require uh, a, stru a structural solution be implemented. Uh, or you may be a municipality that tries to stay ahead of things and simply wants to perform preventative maintenance of the sewer system. Uh, and finally, uh, goals of, re of your rehabilitation program could be to remove infiltration but the program is not necessarily driven by regulatory requirements. You're just trying to remove as much infiltration as possible to, to get the most, quote, unquote, bang for the buck. So in, in a situation where a consent decree or an administrative consent order requires you to remove a large percentage of II, a more aggressive, comprehensive approach is what's actually recommended. Uh, this comprehensive approach consists of rehabilitation of mainline pipes and service lateral connections and manholes, 
all within smaller 20 to 30,000 linear foot subsystems. In a comprehensive rehabilitation program, the idea is to line all mainline sewer pipes and service lateral connections in a given subsystem with CIPP lining and to also rehabilitate all the manholes with some kind of lining or coating system on, on both the walls and the corbel. But, uh, but even these types of programs with these sorts of recommendations will still include some sort of injection grouting in the project. And the reason for that is that not all service lateral connections can be lined with a CIPP liner due to the bends in the lateral pipe or, or to break in taps that are coming in at odd angles. This is why it is important to include injection grouting in your project so that the angular space between the mainline pipe and the CIPP liner can be sealed in situations when a lateral liner cannot be installed. Um, this is certainly a much better solution than doing nothing following the reinstatement of the service. Uh, injection grounding is also used in comprehensive rehabilitation programs during manhole rehabilitation to stop active leaks in manholes prior to lining. Now, if you've performed a condition assessment of your system and you found situations like this picture you see here of a collapsed or partially collapsed sewer pipe, you would first recommend performing a dig and replace spot replacement of the defective pipe. Uh, but, but then you would also recommend CIPP lining of the rest of the pipe and possibly upstream and downstream sections of the sewer as well to prevent additional collapses from also occurring. However, if you have performed a condition assessment and found voids that are around a deteriorated pipe, you would want to recommend filling that void space with grout to ensure that all loads are distributed properly around the CIPP liner once it's been installed. It's kind of like it's kind of like pro like providing a proper pipe bedding for new pipe installations, and and it's required when voids are present to ensure that a structural solution uh, is met with a CIPP liner. Now, if you're a municipality that that tries to be proactive and you're interested in rehabilitating mainline sewers to increase the life of their sewer system, uh, but these are areas that aren't necessarily um, uh, subject to infiltration, you would likely recommend CIPP lining of the mainline pipe. However, since infiltration is not an issue, it makes more sense to recommend the less expensive injection grounding to seal that annular space after the reinstatement of services rather than uh, seal service lateral connection lining. Uh, and then finally, if the goal of your rehabilitation program is to remove infiltration from pipes and manholes, but you're not beholden to regulatory requirements, you're just trying to do the right thing and, and seal up leaking pipes in your system, then recommending testing and sealing of joints with injection grounding is preferred because it's very effective in preventing infiltration and it's much less expensive than CIPP lining. Uh, furthermore, recommending injection grounding is, is really part of proper surface preparation to stop active leaks or sources of previous infiltration for any manhole rehab uh, project. Um, using grout to seal out infiltration ensures that the liner or the coating system makes a strong bond to the manhole walls and it also increases the surface life of the coating systems themselves because we all know that proper preparation is key to uh, correctly installed product. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Juan Bedoya from Miami-Dade. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Juan Bedoya with Miami-Dade Water and Sewer, um, the Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm the Division Chief with the Wastewater and Collections Transmission Line Division of Miami-Dade County. I've been, uh, I've been with the department for 28 years all of which I've been an active sewer rat, so sewer is, uh, is what we do. Uh, let me give you a little oversight of the consumer base of you know, what we deal here, with here in Miami-Dade. We have about 352 retail customers, about 12 municipal wholesale customers. These are uh, uh, cities or municipalities that maintain their own sewers and they buy the water and sell us their sewer. Uh, three regional treatment plants, and we have an average daily flow combined of cl almost close to 300 MTDs. Our inventory consists of about 1,042 pump stations, and that's a lot of pump stations, but, you know, that's due to our flat topography. We, we can only go so deep before we have to pump back up to either to a force main or to another pump station or to another collection system. We have about 920 miles of force main, all of which are 120 miles are PCCP. And we have about 3,000 miles of gravity collection system. That are, those are main lines. That's what I'm considering the laterals. If we consider the laterals, we have close to about 5,500 miles of collection system. So what is unique about Miami-Dade County? 
and like I said before, the, one of the things that's unique about Miami-Dade County and why we have so many pump stations and so many different collection systems is our low topography. Basically, everything here is uh, basically at sea level. We have, we're not very hilly. We're all flat. We have no high points. Our, our highest points are our landfills. Those are the, our hills or our landfills. Are, those are the highest points. We have a very high water table. The areas here in Miami-Dade where the elevation is so low that you could dig down two feet and you'll find water. And we have a very transmissive geology. What does that mean? That means that the water, the, 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 the lime rock is very porous. So you have a, a, a transmission of groundwater horizontally or vertically. It moves and it impacts our, our collection system when it does that. So and, and the reason I'm here today is to talk about why injection grouting is right for us here at Miami-Dade. And what, one of the main reasons is moisture content. Like I said, since uh, we have such a high water table, the majority of the collection system is under the water. It's under the water table. So again, this is due to our low topography and our close proximity to the coast, of course. So what, what does that mean? That means that it mitigates the shrinkage of the grout mass on the outside of the pipe. What is the worst enemy of a grout is lack of moisture or dry conditions. Since we have such a high water table and so much of our system is under the water, uh, it, it, it really, uh, the moisture content is, it really aids us in, 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 the, in the sustainability of grout. We also have a very sandy soil. We have uh, lime rock in combination with sand, which allows for the grout to create you know, a good matrix outside of the joint of the pipe. This is key in grouting. Because in grouting, we're not sealing the joint. We're creating a watertight seal on the outside of the pipe. We're creating a matrix that prevents groundwater from going into the pipe. And the results are is that we've been grouting for over 25 years. And we have an effective grouting program. And I'll get into it a little later on, on some validation that we've done of some old grout lines. So we all know what a typical grout looks, uh, grout injection, uh, look, look, chemical inje injection looks like. But what's different about us is that, yes, we are doing, we do have that matrix on the outside of the pipe, but because of our high water table, the matrix is underwater and it's completely submersed at all times. Again, this aids in preventing shrinkage and in sustaining the longevity of the grout matrix. It's estimated that about 85% of those 3,000 miles of collection system are under the water table. So what repair methodologies are available? We have dig and replace, which is a structural repair. We have CIPP liners, which are, is a structural repair. We have sectional liners, which it can be a structural repair. And we have injection grout. Now, injection grout is a non-structural repair to mitigate or eliminate infiltration into our collection system, whether it's through main lines, laterals, or manholes. So apart from optimal soil conditions for the longevity of the grout, there's, there's another reason why we use grout. And what is the main reason that we use grout is return on investment. What does that mean? For every dollar that we invest into INI reduction, we save about $2.75 in treatment and transmission costs. So for non-structural repairs, the, uh, the cost of grout is minimal in comparison to other structural repairs, and the return on investment is uh, you know, indisputable. This makes for us in injection grouting one of the most cost-effective repair methodologies where, it, where it's applicable, where it's non-structural. Recent validation of grouted joints, we inspected about 20 lines that we grouted that were over 10 years old. Out of, the 10, out of, out of all those 20 lines, 92% of the joints that we inspected were still not leaking. So th these are lines that were grouted over 10 years ago, some of them up to 12, 15 years, and they were still holding. Now, if you consider that, based on the observations, you know, let's say 8%, let's say it was 90%. 10% can be, can be cost-effectively re-grouted on a, on a predetermined cycle, and it's still, you know, 
cheaper to fix or cheaper to regrout or more cost effectively to grout than if you had defects and structural repairs like CIPP or excavations. And um, that's all I got. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Randy Ballinger with Visusur. Thank you, Juan. I appreciate it. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Randy Bellinger. I'm the sales manager with Visio Sewer. Over the past 13 years, I've had the pleasure of specializing in trenchless technologies with an emphasis on cured in place pipe installation and injection grouting. So, what I'd like to start on, first of all, today is addressing what we've seen historically in the ambiguous nature of how uh, grout specifications have been written over time and, and how that can set up a grout project for failure. There's a number of primary contributing factors. Uh, first one is the, the logical desire for the engineer or the, the system owner to define the costs and control the costs. Usually this means including both labor and material in any, any given bid item. The unfortunate thing is by going about it in this methodology, you're, you're allowing the contractor to have to come up with a variety of assumptions to derive their price. Generally, the two primary areas are going to be in the joint failure rate as well as the amount of material that may then be needed to seal each of those failures. Now, if you look at that in a low bid environment, Obviously, any contractor wants the work, otherwise they wouldn't be bidding on the project. And in order to be as competitive as possible, there's going to be a tendency to perhaps minimize the amount of material on any given project that's included in their pricing. Ultimately, for a grout project to be successful, the proper material has to be used to seal the joints completely. We shouldn't be putting a contractor in a position where they have to balance the success of the project against the profitability that they have on the project. So there's really a very simple solution, and that's simply continue to specify uh, on the bid form either a, a per foot or a per joint price, but only have that price include the testing and the sealing, the physical act of doing the work. There should be a separate bid item for the material utilized. And we can continue to do that as a per gallon price, but the quantity, the base quantity in the bid, should be defined by the system owner or the engineer putting the project together, ultimately by determining what the estimated failure rate will be, and then also how many gallons may be needed to seal those, those individual failures. Uh, the second item that I'd like to touch on, and again, this is really as a contractor that does both services, uh, we routinely get questions from clients asking, what should we do? And there's, there's really two thoughts, uh, an in-the-box thought and an out-of-the-box thought. Uh, the in-the-box thoughts relative to both technologies are certainly that grouting itself is a non-structural fix, fantastic for infiltration control, whether it be active or periodic, uh, but it's also widely used to prevent uh, problems during cured-in-place pipe installations by getting rid of active runners or active gushers in advance of the project. Uh, we're also seeing quite a bit of infiltration uh, control with injection grouting after cured-in-place lining projects are completed. In terms of when do we install cured-in-place pipe, Typically, it's, it's historically only been as a structural fix, um, and obviously it, that's taking place when the pipe is deteriorated and, and nearing the end of its useful life. Uh, but we all, as I had mentioned, we are seeing injection grouting coupled with in-place pipe installation more and more frequently. Right now, I would say we're averaging about 50% of the projects that we see. But what I'd like you to do is take a step back and maybe think out of the box a little bit. And I, if we start thinking about injection grouting first to maximize the return on the investment of the sanitary system, I think we can seriously extend the life of the asset. Uh, generally, uh, we're putting projects together, 
We're reviewing video, looking at PACP reports. You know what to look for. You can identify the beginning stages of pipe deterioration. If you look at the picture here, you can see that the pipe is wandering left to right. If I had this as active video, you would also see the camera moving up and down, not to mention a wide variety of open joints or offset joints. So although there's not active infiltration or structural defects being shown in the pipe itself, it's not too far away. As periodic infiltration takes place, the soil fines are washing in from outside the pipe, destabilizing that pipe, and ultimately that's where the cracks and the fractures are going to start to show themselves. So think a little bit ahead, be a little bit proactive. Think about grouting first to stabilize the pipe, stop the infiltration, and I'm confident we'll be extending the life of our asset by an estimated 25 years. So with that, I would like to turn things over to Len Osborne from NASCO. Thank you, Randy. Uh, my name is Len Osborne. I'm NASCO's technical director. And for those of you that don't know, NASCO is the National Association of Sewer Service Companies. Before that, I was with uh, in the CIPP business for over 30 years with Situform Technologies. Well, what I'd like to cover today is when to do both. If there's an ongoing CIPP job, when is grout needed uh, on that job? I'm going to look at three different scenarios. The first is infiltration control, and this is control more from the aspect of the need to install a quality cured-in-place pipe. Uh, some cured-in-place tubes are installed unprotected. The resinous felt is pressed directly up against the hose pipe. And if there's a lot of cold moving water, the resin can be compromised. Also going to look at leaks at service laterals. Uh, when cured-in-place pipe cures, it shrinks a little bit. There's a small annular space around the cured-in-place pipe. Groundwater can track behind the cured-in-place pipe and enter at service ladder. So we'll look at how to take care of that. And then also talk some about soil voids and how soil voids affect cured-in-place pipe installation and how that should be managed. What you see here are the five NASCO PACP infiltration descriptors. The first three, stain, weeper, and dripper, are very self-explanatory, and none are a problem with CIPP installation. The runner, a little bit more water, can be a problem, depending upon the density and number of the runners available. And the gusher is always a problem to the unprotected CIPP tube where the resin is exposed. On the left, you see a photograph with two or three infiltration runners. Uh, in this case, that would not be a problem for uh, the unprotected CIPP to be installed. Uh, if the density of runners was, was higher, and if there were a higher number of runners, and it looked like a shower in the pipe, that could be a problem. Resin could be compromised. So that could be managed by a, a preliner could be installed. That's a film that's installed prior to the cured in place pipe. However, that's not always feasible or readily available. Another way to handle that is with grouting. On the right, you see infiltration gushers. And again, these are always an issue. And if the tube is not protected in some manner, uh, resin can be washed away. So how, is, how are those leaks handled? Well, one way is with grouting. Here you see a mainline packer. It is centered on a leaky joint. Uh, both ends of the packer are expanded. Grout is pumped into the annular space, flows out into the surrounding soil, and stops the leak. If it's an entry size pipe, workers can simply walk in, uh, drill holes through the pipe, and inject grout. Leaks at service laterals. On the left, you see a cured in place pipe that's been installed. Uh, the service lateral has been cut open. Groundwater is tracking behind the cured in place pipe and entering at the opening. This is not a defect in the cured in place pipe. Uh, the project simply isn't finished at this point. How are these leaks stopped? Well, there are a number of ways. There are cured in place options. 
that can be used to stop these leaks, and there are also grouting options. On the right, you see a lateral connection grouting setup, very similar to the mainline grouting, except there's an extension that protrudes up into the lateral. And again, grout is pumped, flows out into the surrounding soil, solidifies, and stops the leak. Soil voids. Here you see an artist's conception of a typical soil void. Uh, it's around and above the pipe. This is not a problem at all to CIPP installation. Below the pipe, if the void was below and the invert of the pipe was gone, that could be a problem because the CIPP could nose into that hole and stop the installation. However, once CIPP is installed, the result is not good because this is not a structural situation. So the bottom line is soil voids that compromise structural integrity should be grouted. And as Jonathan said earlier, that fills that void and provides backfill and support for the existing pipe and ultimately the cured in place pipe. That decision whether or not to grout is typically left to the project engineer. And with that, I'll turn everything back over to Don Rigby of Avanti. Well, thank you very much, Lynn. Grateful to have have your voice and decades of experience with cured in place pipe on this presentation. My role in this webinar is wholly consistent with my role at Avanti. And that is to teach what authorities need to know to make prudent decisions about their collection systems. And I see marketing and education as one and the same. And at every level, the engineer, owner, municipality, contractor, inspector, education is, uh, is the way forward. The purpose of this session is to provide clarity. And I will lead with a few facts, some most undisputed facts. Cured in place pipe is a structural rehabilitation. Injection grouting is non-structural. 50%, according to the US EPA, 50% of the flow to the WWTP or treatment facilities nationwide is clean groundwater from ionized sources due to lack of maintenance. This is a problem, and there is value in addressing that problem. Um, I will be. I'll be uh, very clear, inflow, inflow is surface water entering the system through manhole lids, faulty uh, chimneys, etc., and various other sources. Infiltration is, is groundwater entering into the collection system through the points identified on this slide, including laterals, surface lateral connections, mainline joints, and, of course, manholes. Here's a more complex image that supports um, the dynamics underground. I want to pay particular attention to the location of the sanitary sewer in relation to the storm sewers. As a rain event occurs, storm sewers will surcharge and exfiltrate. Water does what it exactly does flawlessly. It flows to the lowest point of entry, lowest point uh, follows gravity, and it will surround itself around the sanitary uh, sewer trench, much like a, a French drain. So this is a direct, you know, infiltration is a significant cause of structural decay. And what it ushers in supporting soils from the sewer trench, and which causes excessive jetting and cleaning, which is necessary to keep the capacity up and, of course, nothing infuriates the EPA more than sanitary sewer overflows. I and I is a major factor. Injection grouting is both a proactive maintenance practice and an engineer construction project. There are dozens of communities that still recognize maintenance as an important value to their ratepayer and is proactively maintaining the system. Others are waiting for uh, enforcement to take action on II. I understand the conventional wisdom to line pipe because it does have a, a once and done 
sense to it. But is it? But is it? I mean, is it worth four times the expense to line an eight-inch mainline pipe when it does little to satisfy or stop eye and eye or infiltration? And lining 24-inch pipe is exponentially more costly, maybe five times more costly. Well, that's not the case with injection grouting. Let's look at uh, let's look at some costs, and these costs are coming from coast-to-coast -coast numbers, north to south. Um, so I've, I've expressed them in ranges. So let's take eight-inch mainline pipe where, it's, where CIPP is truly optimized and the cost has come down significantly. Um, for pipe grouting, where it's $69 a lineal foot. For pipe lining, we're in the $20 to $30 range. So it's about four times the expense to line versus to, to grout. When it comes to laterals and lateral connections specifically, uh, a lateral connection can be 350 to $500 per connection, where the lining alternative is much more costly and sometimes 10 times the expense to, to, uh, to line. Now, I fully expect that the cost for lining connections to drop much like mainline has as well. Over time, it will drop. But right now, that's, that's a fact. Grouting and lining are certainly complementary technologies. But please don't rule out that injection grouting is a standalone solution for controlling infiltration. So grout first to stop infiltration, DIPP line second for structural repair. And grout last to reinstate laterals, deal annular space between the host pipe and liner, and stabilize that sewer trench at that critical juncture from further um, de degradation. Another point, final point, to win against I&I, &I, you have to be holistic. I'm familiar with the top 10 major sewer district in this country that spent millions on, on li maining, uh, lining main lines and experienced zero reduction in flow to the wastewater treatment plant. So to win against I&I, &I, you, you have to take a holistic approach to include manholes, main lines, laterals, and lateral conduction connections. Do it over time, but, but it has to be done. And one final thought. I do think that uh, uh, first defense against infiltration as a standalone solution, injection grouting is that. Injection grouting is also the first and last step in conjunction with CIPP lining. I do believe we can make a business case for saving millions for our municipalities to give municipal grouting and injection grouting a quick look. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Mike at Transfers Technology. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Don. Uh, we're at the midpoint of the presentation, and we have some questions coming in. I have one here I'm hoping uh, Jonathan can answer for us. Jonathan, which is the bigger problem? Is it infiltration from manholes, or is it infiltration from main lines and laterals? Uh, well, Mike, uh I would say that considering well when you when you look at when you look at uh, a sewer system you have the mainline pipe and service connections and as an example if you have a uh, a community with let's just say 100 miles of sanitary sewer mainline pipe that means you have roughly another 50 miles if not more more like 50 somewhere between 50 and 60 miles of service laterals as well so that's a whole lot of pipes now in in contrast there, the number of manholes that you would have, you know, on a rough estimate, it's every 250 feet. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. So it's a nice average, I think, 250 feet. So the number of manholes would, would be drastically less. So there's just, there's just a lot more joints and a lot more pipe out there uh, when you think about both service and mainline. So I would, I would have to say that, that mainline pipes and laterals uh, contribute more infiltration than just manholes themselves. All right. Th thanks for that answer. Before beginning the second half of this presentation, we'd like to take another poll. Um, what you guys are what are we answering the poll? I'd like to remind everyone that this is an interactive event. So, following the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. You can participate by typing your question into the designated panel in the left-hand portion of the screen. Let's take a look at the results that we have coming in before we begin. All right. One more. All 
Hi, it looks like so the answer to the question, CIPP and injection grouting are complementary tech technologies. When would you use both? We had 87% of the people, of the respondents said all of the above, and 12 and a half said before lying to stop infiltration. Uh, we had 2% after lying to seal annulus between host pipe and liner, and then 0% for the other two options. The second half of today's presentation focuses on what's trending and what's next for this segment of the industry. And with that, I'd like to turn the discussion back to Don. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. You know, it was a year ago that Trensys Technology Magazine and, and a lot of the Avanti, uh, Avanti resources and, and uh, the grouting community got together and did a documentary on municipal grouting. And we... We celebrated 50 years, we looked at the past, looked at present, we forecasted the future. It was a great event. And, but we spent a lot of time talking about 40 years, the first 40 years. There were no rules. There were no guidelines. There were no standards to follow. And you will realize that grouting is a perfect science. And it's about execution that really matters. And we now have guidelines, and we have ASTM performance standards, and we have operating standards from NASCO and ICGA. These are a second edition um, to now be able to deliver a more consistent, reliable end product. And over the next year, probably in uh, next mid next year, NASCO will be able to support a new program for grouting or inspector training. I do anticipate more inspectors on more grouting jobs in the ensuing years, all of which helps engineers and their municipality customers or clients feel better about the, uh, about the outcome. There is a new standard coming out, and I'll see that probably within the year from um, um, that will be focused on pressure testing and grouting of sewer joints, laterals, and lateral connections. This is centered around the ITCP program, and it's a manual that's written for both engine, for the engineering community, for the inspectors, and for the technicians. All will be working off of a single hymnal, which will allow for higher confidence factors in um, for engineers and municipalities. And as always, uh, we will be a lead uh, resource for educating all those communities on the virtue value of ejection grouting for municipalities. And uh, I'll let Lynn weigh in on uh, his thoughts over the next ensuing years. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Don. Um, I'd like to continue with the theme There we go. I'd like to continue with the theme of success based on execution and first read you a part of the NASCO mission statement to set industry standards for the rehabilitation and assessment of underground infrastructure. And how do we do that? And we think it starts with training and education. A few examples, inspector training and certification program, the ITCP program. This is where students are trained and certified in CIPP installation and manhole re rehabilitation. And you just heard Don talk about grout. Well, there's a program being developed for grout at this time. There's the widely successful Pipeline Assessment Certification Program, PACP. This is a standardized method to code defects in sewers. NASCO does a full education day at the WWETT conference organizes five four-hour tracks at the UCT conference, and holds webinars and participates in webinars such as this one. One of the marquee events NASCO has annually is the rehab zone at UCT. A large area of the UCT exhibit floor is set aside for the rehab zone. It is set up with multiple technologies and industry experts, and it's a no-sell zone where TVs can walk through without stress. Uh, they can view 
classroom presentations, and full-scale demonstrations. So what's a coming attraction? Well, there's the TAGR, Trenchless Assessment Guide Rehabilitation. NASCO did this with the Trenchless Technology Center several years ago. And it's a program for selecting rehabilitation methods by entering design parameters, and then the program will give you the various rehabilitation methods that are appropriate for that particular, those particular design parameters. However, it's a single shot. NASCO is entering into a program to update TAGR. And one of the big updates is it's going to be capable of importing the PACP Exchange database. For example, if you have just completed inspecting 100 manhole to manhole line segments using PACP software, uh, that entire database can be imported direct, will be able to be imported directly into TAGR so that you don't have to enter those line segments one by one along with all of the design information. It will greatly increase its usability. Also, product databases will be updated for those products that have expanded capabilities since, since the first version of TAGR. And products will be added that have come onto the market since uh, the first version of TAGR. In addition, it will be designed such, a, such that future modules, such as a cost database, uh, risk analysis, which is also a part of PACP, and a social cost calculator can be added. At this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Randy Bellinger of VisuSur. Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate it. There's a couple different areas where I see the industry trending. Uh, first one somewhat dovetails with uh, what Lynn had mentioned in terms of a, an inspection training program for chemical grouting. But in addition to that, I, I see a need for uh, grout technician certification programs. It's been talked about in a number of different areas. And the reason for this is simply grout projects are, have a lot of variables, um, a lot of unique circumstances, and you need somebody on the project site that's not just a laborer, but somebody that can actually make educated decisions um, right out of the gate Testing of equipment is very important. Uh, the various pressures, the pump ratios, uh, sizing of equipment obviously is going to have a, a huge impact on the project. But even getting into the material itself, uh, gel set times are critical to success. Uh, very simply, the amount of catalyst in the mixture can affect the gel times, as well as the temperatures. Not only the temperatures inside the grout tanks, but also uh, the ambient temperature as the material perhaps cools through hoses as it's running above ground. Another area where we see a lot of critical variability is the solids content of the mixture. If you're in a fairly dry environment, uh, you may not need as many solids in the mixture as when you're pumping material into a very wet environment as you have high groundwater mixing with the, the grout material, it will dilute the material and may cause uh, or affect the, the success of the project. Another area that I've been seeing a lot of movement towards is private property I and I reduction projects. Now it's interesting that this really started to show up a couple of years ago, probably two, three years ago, as lateral lining became more popular and started being specified for INI reduction programs on private property. We've been seeing a little bit of pushback uh, simply due to the, the problem of using public dollars for private property. Uh, lining in general is perceived, you know, rightly so in a lot of ways, as a structural repair. And we've seen literally situations where one neighbor views that their other neighbor is actually getting a new lateral and they, they're viewing that as, as not a fair circumstance. Uh, push then has been towards grouting on private property simply due to its cost effective nature and also that perception that uh, one neighbor over another isn't actually getting a, a new lateral benefit. All of this of course is predicated on lateral 
private property I and I ordinances being written. There's not a lot of them throughout the country, but obviously that is growing. Uh, and it's simply growing, I think, because the the benefit to the entire system of eliminating private property INI is, is very easily quantified. Uh, the next area that I'd like to touch on to il illustrate this is actually bringing up a project in the city of Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. Uh, Wauwatosa, an, an engineering firm, put together a rain event simulation project using soaker hose testing and storm sewer dye flooding to uh, get a baseline flow from private property I and I. You can see in the graph here, the gray line is the baseline flows. And then the first step of the project was to line from the main to the right of way about 30 feet. And there you can see round A or the blue line. The results were pretty dramatic. They got rid of about 70% of the I and I in that area. But unfortunately, it was a little bit cost prohibitive. You can see some of the results here in terms of dollars. Lateral lining was about $4,700 per lateral, even though they had great results. Uh, because of the cost, subsequent projects moving forward were actually grouting of the connections and roughly five feet up the lateral. They were able to eliminate an estimated 25% of the private property I and I in this methodology for only about $470 per lateral. So you're looking at about a 10% cost uh, relative to lining to achieve 33% of the, the I and I reduction. With these types of results, I certainly anticipate uh, these types of projects are going to continue to move forward. And with that, I'd like to turn things back over to Juan. All right, so I'm up. This is Juan again, and I'd like to talk about the future here at Miami-Dade. So the next two to five years for Miami-Dade, we continue to look at transfer technologies. So we're always looking at new technologies and new methodologies that are out there. Um, I have an aging uh, infrastructure. I have systems that are 50, 60, uh, even some over 60 years old. So we're always looking for ways to uh, cost-effectively extend the lifespan of those assets. For non-structural for non-structural groundwater leaks, however, injection grout continues to be the most cost-effective repair available. We have 12 trucks on the road, and we're going to continue to uh, where non-structural defects are evident and infiltration is the defect that needs to be repaired. Uh, chemical injection, grout injection is going to continue to be one of the method main methodologies that we use to repair. We'll continue to always look at return on investment, cost effectiveness, not cost. What is the return? How much are we extending the life cycle of that asset? And when will we have to go back to that asset? How long is it going to last? We estimate that, you know, uh, infiltration at the treatment plants, we have out of the 300 MGD that I mentioned in the beginning, we estimate that that's about 20 to 23 MGD of the, of the flow to the plants is infiltration. So we feel that what's worked until now will continue to work into the foreseeable future. I mean, I'd just like to close with a, just a statement about aging infrastructure. We're all faced with aging infrastructure. Pipe is old. We see articles in the newspaper about aging infrastructure and aging infrastructure. And the age alone should not be the only consideration for action on action uh, for action on, on on maintenance or rehabilitation of an asset. You know, there's also some pipes are late in their life expectancy. We're looking at some pipes that might have a hundred year lifespan, and most of the times we have most of the times it's the joints that fail, not the pipes themselves. I have a lot of that here in Miami Dade where we have a lot of vertified clay pipe. Some of these pipes look fantastic, and it's the actual joints that fail only. So with a minimal investment of just grouting the joints, I could expend that life of that asset for 10, 12, 15 years and not have to make any big capital investments into that asset. 
And uh, grout injections rep just represents a way to extend the life of those assets as opposed to more costly replacements like dig and replace or CIPP or, or any other methodologies. And with that, I will turn it over to Jonathan. Thanks, Juan. So we've been talking, in terms of the future, we've been talking about training, certification, and the importance of installing rehab products properly, and, and then Juan just got into what, what's going on in Miami-Dade and what they continue to do. But in terms of industry trends and, and where the market is headed, uh, I, I think it's best we first start looking at the scope of the problem. So according to ASCE uh, 2017 Infrastructure Report Card, uh, they, the, the wastewater infrastructure in the United States is rated currently as a D plus. Now, the positive news is that this grade is actually up from a D minus the last time this report came out. So this is obviously some good news. We've made some progress and done some work. However, we still have a long way to go to bring our infrastructure up to an acceptable level of service. Based on this, it's estimated, ASCE, ASCE estimates that approximately $150 billion will need to be spent in the rehabilitation of both water and wastewater systems across the country over the next nine to ten years. Now, that, that does include water, uh, to, to be clear, but they didn't, they didn't separate out water and wastewater, so that's why I'm reporting it this way. Uh, now, since only about $45 billion has been identified for funding, there exists a $105 billion gap in investment that we're going to need to figure out how to bridge if we want to improve our infrastructure moving forward. Now, because I'm speaking to you from, from Boston, Massachusetts, uh, I thought it would be appropriate to describe a new regulation uh, imposed by the Massachusetts DEP that's called 314 CMR 12, which requires all municipalities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to submit an II plan by December 31st, 2017. Now, if a plan already exists, then you're all set and all you have to do is show the DEP that you've been making progress on those recommendations that are detailed in that existing plan and that you're moving forward a a as planned. Um, but I mention this because I was told that Massachusetts has at times been at the forefront of new policies like this and has in some cases led the way for other states to follow suit. So that being said, it's quite possible that, in, that municipalities in other states could see requirements like this in the not too distant future. And, and what this means is that we will start seeing more and more rehabilitation work take place throughout the country, which is obviously a positive thing and it coincides nicely with the sheer volume of work that needs to be done to our wastewater collection systems according to ASCE. Now, however, I still believe that the, the rate of rehabilitation in our collection systems does not even come close to keeping pace with the degradation or decay of the infrastructure itself. Uh, and that in order to really keep up with our aging infrastructure, we must do more rehabilitation work much more quickly across this country as a whole. And now I'll turn this back over to Mike to start the Q&A. Thank you, Jonathan, and thanks to all of our presenters today. As Jonathan said, uh, we have a few minutes remaining here for the Q&A portion of the presentation. Uh, if we receive more questions and we have time to answer live, we'll answer the other questions offline following today's presentation. So I'd like to start things off with uh, this question. How do you best identify voids outside of the pipe? I think my uh, question is, is for me. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Sure. Um, so this is Jonathan. Uh, yeah, I had mentioned oh, voids in, in my initial uh, part of the presentation. Uh, generally speaking, I could say there's, there's two ways. Generally speaking, if you have a situation where there's a, a giant void outside the pipe that is causing a structural uh, deficiency, a lot of fines would have been would have washed in uh, at that defect, and there's probably a pretty bad defect that exists, such that you likely could see the void itself there. Um, if if you have a situation, otherwise, yes, it, it's it's virtually impossible inside the pipe if there's no defect there to know that there's a void. But as I said, if there is a void that is causing a problem, the pipe doesn't likely look very good inside with a TB inspection. Alternatively, though, I will say that. If you have the ability to use uh, a ground penetrating radar and you have a TV inspection that doesn't show the pipe looking really horrible, but it's just full of debris clearly coming from a, a joint that maybe looks a little bit separated and you suspect that there could be a, a big void there, 
some sort of ground penetrating radar could pick up on a void that's present and let you know that it's there. All right, thank you. Uh, here's a question for the entire panel. How does INI create structural problems? Well, I think we tried to allude to that earlier. Um, the soil finds to get ushered in from infiltration that take up important capacity. That is supported soils that's very necessary to keep that pipe trench in place and, and support that mainline pipe and that lateral lateral connection. In the absence of that support, uh, the pipe segment stays strong. It's the joints that fail. And that's how and why soil loss, soil finds coming in can create structural decay. Now, here, here's a question. Um, I think maybe Lynn can take this one. It says, uh, we, you described CIPP as a structural solution. For years, Lynn and his non-institute form competitors offered both structural and non-structural design thickness of CIPP. Has the non-structural, i.e. relying on the host pipe for support alternative gone away? Uh, no, uh, and I'd like to thank Wayne for that question. Um, I think structural and non-structural, you know, if you check ASTM F 1216, the descriptors are fully deteriorated and partially deteriorated. Fully deteriorated uh, means the cured in place pipe is designed to withstand all soil, groundwater, live loads, dead loads. But partially deteriorated means the cured in place pipe is designed to withstand the external pressures of groundwater. So they're both structural solutions. Uh, they're just designed for different things. Can the panel provide details on joint testing? The uh, our audio connection is getting marginal. Can you repeat that, uh, Mike, for us all? Uh, can the question is: Can you provide details on the joint? Testing. This, this question came in during the first uh, half of the discussion. Uh, joint testing is an air test. And it's an air test that um, is administered, and if it's leaking air, it's going to leak water. Most of the time, when CCTV or when we're grouting and air testing, um, it's not in, after a rainfall event. So you can't visually see leaking water. So we go back in and we will air test every joint before and after grouting. We air test before to test to see if there is an air leak. If it's leaking air, it's going to leak water. After we grout, we air test again to make certain that it's sealed. And we don't progress to the next joint to air test until that's resolved. Hopefully that answers the question. Looking at the clock here, we have time for one more question. Uh, Lynn, this one is directed at you. But what's the best way to identify where soil voids may exist outside both gravity or pressure sewers? Well, uh, Jonathan more or less or, or did answer this question. But uh, again, summarizing, I think if there is a void, uh, you may see evidence of that from inside the pipe, soil leaking in, offset joint. Or you may simply be able to see the joint or see the void. I've seen that many times. Uh, sometimes you can't. There's a void there you can't see. And uh, there are technologies uh, for finding the void. Uh, ground penetrating radar is probably the most common. I know there's a newer technology out now that is literally an MRI type technology for looking through pipe walls. Uh, plus, thermal imaging from above ground has been used for many years to find those toys. Uh, it's not always easy, but there are some technologies available. All right. Th thank you, Lynn. I'd like to close this presentation with our final poll. Uh, and just a reminder, we have lots of questions, great questions, that we didn't get to address during this live Q&A. These will be addressed offline via email. And I'd also like to note that within 24 hours, the attendees will receive a follow-up email with a link to the promise document 
the current NASCO ICGA suggested standard specification for pressure testing and grouting of sewer joints, lateral, and lateral connections, as well as contact information to continue the dialogue with today's subject matter experts. Now, let's take a look at the, the results for the poll, final poll here, asking the question, the future of trenches continues to look bright. Why is it important to you? Uh, to no surprise, 75% of the users selected reduced project costs, 33% uh, selected sustainability, and 19% minimal disruption. Uh, thank you, everybody. This concludes our Trenchless Technology webinar today. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us, and I would also like to thank all of the subject matter experts for their participation and Avanti for sponsoring the session. We encourage everyone to take the post-webinar survey, and as a reminder, today's webinar will be archived under the Education tab at trenchlesstechnology.com if there is something you missed or would like to refer back to. Thank you again, everyone, and we look forward to interacting with all of you at a future webinar.